if the kids will all come forward and Miss Allison is gonna talk to us. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> I have a big word for you today. It is stewardship. Does anybody know what that means? What? Stand up for someone. What? Stand up for someone. Stand up for someone? Not quite. Is it work? Ah, uh ha! -huh. Okay, so let me tell you what stewardship means. It means taking care of all of God's blessings to you in God's way for God's glory. So, does anybody, okay, I want y'all to think of something that God has blessed you with this week. Can you th think of it in your head, okay? All right, so on the count of three, I want everybody to say what God has blessed you with this week. You ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Making your brother feel better? That's a great blessing. So I have another question for you. Has anybody seen these? Do you know that this is... It's an envelope, but it's not, it's not like an envelope that you send a letter in. This is a very, very special envelope. It is for money. Do you know that money is one of the blessings from God? So, <laughs> yes, you do know that? So every Sunday, people in our congregation, they put their offering in the envelopes. They put the money in the, in what? They put the envelope in one of these, right? And that money goes to the church. For what, though? Money. <laughs> what? Mission 5000 is one of them, yes. And they go to help the church to teach people about God and to do things that God has asked the church to do. Some of the things you use in your Sunday school class? Yes. Yes, very good. All right, so has anybody ever put any money in one of these envelopes? You have? Yeah? Yeah? Did, did you like doing that? Did it make you feel great to give to God? All right, so does anybody have any offering to give today already? No? Okay. So I have some envelopes up here already, and I have some money. So I'm going to give everybody a quarter and an envelope. And so what are y'all going to do with that quarter and envelope, do you think? In the offering? Yeah, yeah, put it in the offering plate. All right, so that's your mission for today, okay? During church, you got to get your envelope ready to put in the offering plate, okay? All right, let's pray, and then I'll give you all, all your offering. Are you ready? Dear God, please help us understand how we are to do your work through praying, helping others, and giving offering to you. Amen.
I fear uh, that my daughter was going to say, that's a coloring pad when she saw the envelope. So, And also, I feel sorry for whoever gets to count the money today because there's going to be a lot of quarters to count, right? I get to count them. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If you'll join me for the prayer of illumination, it is printed in your bulletin and it's on the screen. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of the Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The reading today comes from Genesis chapter 27, verses 1 through 24. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called his elder son Esau and said to him, My son, and he answered, Here I am. He said, See, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, bow and go out to the field and hunt game for me. Then prepare for me savory food, such as I like, and bring it to me to eat, so that I may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it in, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me game and prepare savory food for me to eat that I may bless you before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my word as I command you. Go to the flock and get me two choice kids so that I may prepare from them savory food for your father, such as he likes, and you shall take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to his mother, Rebekah, Look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am of smooth skin. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my word and go get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother prepared savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best garments of her elder son Esau, which were in her, with her in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. And she put the skins of the kids on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she handed him the savory food and the bread that she had prepared to her son Jacob. So he went in to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Sorry. Come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went up to his father Isaac, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really my son Esau? He answered, I am. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Indeed, we are starting the, the most wonderful series that everyone looks forward to during the year called the Stewardship Series. Are we t Amen. Well, good. And I hope that uh, this year, as we've, as we've had in the past, it's a very positive time to think about how God can use us in ministry. And I appreciate John sharing his story. Uh, and it's amazing, really an amazing story about how God takes who we are and uses it for God's good work. And Charles, one of the men that he mentioned, uh, found hope in our church, found life and has now 
now since moved, moved from Jacksonville, but uh, came back to life because of the relationships that we as a congregation built with him, and particularly one with John. But what is the dream that God has for us as a congregation, and, and even as individuals? What is God's dream for us all? And that's what our series will be, will be thinking about. What is God's dream? What is God's dream for the world? What is God's dream for us as a church? And how do we live into that dream, being good stewards? So I invite you to stand for the reading of our second text today. It comes out of Genesis chapter 28. We'll be reading verses... 10 through 20, 22. The word comes to the center of the congregation as a reminder that this is God's gift for all God's people. And we stand because we love God and we love God's word. Hear these words from Genesis 28, 10 through 22. Now Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to the heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring." Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Then Jacob woke in his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid. And he said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took a stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first place. Then G Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me the bread to eat and the clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you, have, you give me, I will surely give one-tenth to you. This is the word of God for we the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, for the opportunity to hear about how you are at work among us and through us. We give you thanks that you take our lives and that you use them for the redeeming of others, that you take our experiences and that you bring new life out of them. We give you thanks and we give you praise for your grace and mercy at work in us. We ask, dear Lord, that we would hear your word today, and having heard it, that it would be planted in our hearts, that there it would grow and bear fruit, and that it would bring life to the world. O oh Lord, allow my words to be your words and my heart your heart. If anything I say be untrue, let it fall away and never be remembered. But in all things, may you receive honor and glory and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. One of my favorite responses to people when they ask me how I'm doing, they'll say, how are you doing? And I'll say, just living the dream. Uh, because I think, I, you know, I am just kind of living the dream. I have a pretty good life. And how many of you all have ever said you're living the dream? A few of us have said it. Some of us may think, never have said it, never thought I was living the dream. But, you know, when we say that phrase, we mean that we're, we're living kind of the best life now. We're living the one we've always dreamed of. It's this colloquialism that we use often to talk about this ideal that we want to be part of, this, this hope, this dream, this wish that we want to uh, experience in our lives. And so we say living, you know, if we're living our best life, we are living the the dream, right? Now, I would imagine that if you were to think over the course of your life, that that dream, that, that what you picture as the ideal life has changed over time. So when I was a kid, you can imagine what my dream was, right? Seeing this picture, I dreamed of being a cowboy. 
Not a Dallas cowboy, but a real cowboy, right? And I dreamed that, uh, you know, that I would one day grow up and I would be part of the Wild West. And look, I moved to Arkansas, and now I'm part of the Wild West. Uh, sadly, I'm not a cowboy. But I remember as a kid, like, imagining and living into that dream. I would spend countless hours outside imagining that I was, uh, you know, on the Oregon Trail going out west and trying to survive. And I remember as a kid, my grandfather got me one of those silver cap guns, you know, uh, and you could put the paper in it. Y'all remember the paper caps you could get, the orange paper caps, and you'd load that thing up, and I would go around terrorizing all the pets across the neighborhood because I was a true cowboy. Actually, this reminds me of a story not too long ago when I was serving in Bologna, there was a there was a little boy uh, who uh, told his dad uh, or who uh, told his sister he didn't believe in Jesus. And the, 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 the sister ran to, the two, to mom and dad and said, uh, Thomas doesn't believe in Jesus anymore. He doesn't believe in Jesus. And a little confused by it, they said, what do you, what do you mean you don't believe in Jesus, Thomas? And he said, yeah, I don't believe in Jesus because I'm a cowboy. Apparently cowboys don't believe in Jesus. But anyways, that was not written in the sermon, so you got that one for free. Uh, <laughs> But I had this dream of being this cowboy, and, but as, as life kind of continued on, that dream kind of disappeared because I got new and different dreams. And I imagine as your life has transitioned, your dreams of, of what your life could be like or should be like or might be like kind of changed over time. So, you know, I, you know, I used to have this dream that maybe one day I'll own this house in the Caribbean, right? Or this house, yeah, that, you know, and my grass would look like that. Or this house, you know, this is more like my dream these days. Um, uh, you know, a tiny house would be fine with me. But I imagine if you were to think about what your dream is for your life, I imagine that it's changed over time. And I imagine part of the reason it's changed over time is because you have been influenced by other people's dreams. If, uh, if let's say, your parents might have imposed a dream upon you. Like, my dad wanted me to be a baseball star. That didn't last very long. Uh, you know, I want my daughter to be a ballerina. Are you going to be a ballerina? No, uh, but we, we have these dreams that are often given to us as well that, uh, that we seek to live into. I mean, one of, the, one of the ones we probably all think about in terms of society, at least in America, is we think about the American dream. Right? That we have this dream of living this ideal life. Now, interestingly enough, in the 21st century, we often define the American dream in very materialistic terms, right? Bigger house, better car, uh, bigger bank account. Oddly enough, uh, when the, one, the man who wrote the Epic of America, James Treslow Adams, when he defined the American dream, he defined it in terms of ideals or values more than material. And he said, life should be better and richer and fuller for every person with opportunity for each according to his ability or achievement. It's not a dream of motor cars or high, high wages merely, but a dream of social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable. We are given dreams to live into, whether it's a societal dream or a dream given to us by our parents or maybe even a personal dream that we want to be cowboys, we want to grow up and be cowboys and we live into that dream. Or maybe you had a dream of being a doctor and you grew up into that dream. There's an important thing about dreams. Dreams propel us into the future. A vision for what the future could be. We end up living those dreams out in our uh, world. Sometimes our dreams are dashed. Sometimes the dreams we always had uh, come crashing down because of circumstance in our life. And yet the ability to dream pushes us further into our lives. I wonder today, what is your dream? Whose dream are you living? And what does that dream look like? Jacob from the Old Testament certainly had a variety of dreams in his life. Jacob, we hear about today, he's an interesting character in the Old Testament. Uh, when I think about Jacob, I think, really? God chose you, Jacob? I mean, if you read the whole story of his life, he was kind of a swindler. 
He, he, you know, he wasn't the perfect person. Uh, when Jacob was born, you may remember he was born a twin. He had a brother named Esau, which we heard about in, in the passage Kay, Kay read today. And uh, when he was born uh, as twins, his, his mother used to complain all the time that there was like this battle going on in the womb between Jacob and Esau, like two nations were fighting against one another all the time. And then when Jacob was born, or when Esau was born, Esau was born first. Do you all remember? Remember what Jacob was doing when Esau came out of the womb? He was grabbing the heel of his brother Esau. He didn't want to be last. In fact, we are told in the scriptures that Jacob's name literally means heel grabber. Heel grabber. And that is, becomes though for Jacob what his dream or the vision of his life is. That he spends the rest of his life trying to live out this idea that he is a heel grabber. That he is always trying to put himself at the advantage. Always grabbing at someone else's heel so that he can be first in the world. And so he lives that dream out in his, in, in his life. We heard about it today in the passage that Kay read about how he's a heel grabber. Esau and Jacob have now grown up, and it comes time for uh, their father Isaac to bless them. And as the firstborn, Esau would have received the greater blessing. But Rebecca, his wife, didn't want that to happen. She preferred uh, Jacob, the trickster, the heel grabber. And so told Jacob all about it. I heard that Isaac is about to bless Esau. And this is what he's going to do. He, he, wants, he wants Esau to go out and cook a good meal and bring it to him. And there he will bless him. And so we're going to devise a plan. And you're going to continue to be the heel grabber. And you're going to live into that name. And, and you're going to steal Esau's birthright and blessing from him. Do you all remember the story? And so what happens well, Rebecca cooks this good meal and gives it to Jacob and says, take this to your father and let him eat it. And so he does. And, and to, to disguise himself, they put animal skin and hair on him because he was a smooth-skinned man. And uh, I like to think he was bald. But he, uh, he went in and he served this meal and Isaac almost like something was up, but he couldn't figure it out. Like, how did you get this game so fast? And Oh, well, the Lord blessed me. And, oh, well, let me touch you to see if this really is my son Esau. And he touched him and touched that animal here, and he tricked him. And then his father blessed him, gave away the birthright give it, supposed to be given to his brother Esau. He was the heel grabber, the one who had this dream in his life that to get ahead, you always had to trick the other person. It kept on in his life, although one time his future father-in-law got the best of him, if you remember. He switched his daughters out. He had loved Rachel, but ended up marrying Leah by accident. I'm not sure how that happens, but, but his father-in-law tricked him, but then he tricked him back, if you remember. And he required, you know, Jacob's father-in-law required him to stay at home and uh, to stay and, and work for him another seven years to win the other daughter in marriage. And, and in the course of time, though, Jacob began breeding animals that were stronger for his flock and then giving his father-in-law the weaker. Jacob spent his entire life living out this dream, this dream of being the heel grabber. That is until God intervened in his life and gave him a new dream. You may remember this dream. We read about it today where Jacob lays down. He's left his family. He's left, uh, he left his father. He had, he's, his brother was going to kill him. This is before he met his future wives. And God encountered him one night while he was laying down. And Jacob saw this awesome vision. A vision of angels ascending and descending from heaven upon earth. A sign that God was present in the world. And Jacob, suddenly his mind began to be expanded about who this God was. The one he had heard about probably from his father Jacob and from his grandfather Abraham. Or his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham. And God makes a promise to Jacob. Jacob, I will be with you. And I will give you all this land that is here 
and your, your uh, family will be as like the dust of the earth, and they will spread from the north and to the south and to the east and to the west, and they will be great. It was as if God was saying, you don't have to be the heel grabber anymore, the trickster, the swindler. There's a new name for you. Isn't this how God often operates in our lives? God often intervenes in our lives and gives us a new picture for what our, what our lives might look like? Like, uh, like we, we, we wanted to be a cowboy, but then God grabs attention. God grabs our attention and said, I have a better life for you, a good life. But then life goes on. God intervenes and we taste the goodness of God and we see how good God can be and what that dream God might have for us. But then life gets in the way. Circumstances come up and I remember I'll tell you a story about myself. See, uh, in college I was going to be a psychologist. That was I actually have a degree in psychology, and that was where I was headed. And, and yet years before in, in youth I had felt called into the ministry, but I kind of blew it off. I said, there's other things for me that, you know, I have this dream, this vision of being a psychologist. And so I pursued that degree in college because life just kind of happened. And that goodness of that moment when I experienced God's grace and I experienced this call into ministry faded. And I imagine for a lot of us, we have experienced God's dream in our lives. We've seen a big vision of what God can do with us or what God can do with our church. But life just happens. And yet the story of God is that God never gives up on us. God still dreams for us. Think about the story of Jacob. I told you he had this awesome dream of angels ascending and descending upon the earth. And then his life kind of continued. He got married and uh, ended up getting a family. And, uh, but then he uh, was going to meet his brother Esau again after many years of animosity. He feared seeing his brother, if you remember the story. And he sent all his family out in front of him and sent a, a bunch of gifts out to Esau, thinking because Esau, when he last saw him, vowed to kill him because of how he had been tricked and stolen his birthright. And Jacob lays down to rest, if you remember again, and a man shows up and begins to wrestle with him. And then wrestling with him, uh, he discovers this is the angel of the Lord. This is God in his presence. And he hurts his hip. And Jacob says, I want to know your name. Who are you? And he says, I will not let you know my name, but I will give you a new name. And you shall be Israel, the one who wrestles with God. Suddenly a new dream been given to Jacob. All the past has been washed away and a new vision for what Jacob can be in the world. That one time he had tasted and it was so good of what it could be and his life kind of moved on from that. But God never gave up on Jacob. And I want you to know that God has never given up on any of us or our church. That God has a dream for all of us to live into. Maybe this is the first time you've ever tasted that dream and you've experienced God's grace and you want to know what it's like. Or maybe you've lived your life and you've tasted it time and time again, but you've wanted to step into that dream. Well, today is the day to live God's dream. But I want to ask, whose dream are you living? Are you living your own dream? Are you living a mixture of God's dream and your own dream? Are you living someone else's dream for you? Are you living a dream of circumstance because what has happened in your life? I'd invite you today to let go of all those dreams that you are living and invite God's dream into your heart. In the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.